give for you. We are thankful for all of our men that God has given us here at the church. I thank God for men that uh, that come to church. I, I'm serious when I say that. Uh, they, there's a lot of places you go in today's world that men stay at home and moms are trying to get to church and bring children to church. And we understand a lot of men have to work and things like that, but I just thank God for that they come when they can. And then those that are here and those that are working the church, I thank God for our, for our fathers. And uh, uh, so we, we just uh, want you to make sure that you honor them today, your father, your dad. Uh, make sure you give them a call and, or send a text or, uh, or whatever you do. You know, just let them know that you appreciate them. And uh, we just thank God for them. All right, we're taking our Bibles this morning to the book of Psalms chapter 8. The book of Psalms chapter number 8. And bring the message that God's put on our hearts entitled... What is man? What is man? And uh, no, I've not read that book. That men are, you know, men are from one place and women from another. I've not read that. I just read my Bible. Hey, Amen. So if you find your place, Psalm chapter eight, you may stand in honor of reading God's word. Let us, if we can, try to read all nine verses of this chapter where the Bible says, "O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is Thy name in all the earth, who has set Thy glory." Above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and suckling hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mayest still the enemy and the anger. When I consider thy heavens, the works of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man? that thou visited him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and fish of the sea, and whatsoever passeth through the pass of the seas. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Let us pray, Father. I do now have, ask that you have your blessings on the reading of thy word. I pray, Lord God, that you have your blessings upon the service today. God, that you just touch our hearts, Lord. I pray this morning as we challenge the hearts of the men, Lord, that they may honor you and glorify thee. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us Lord, that we may be obedient to thy will. For these things we do ask in thy name. Amen and amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Now, let me remind you, now since we're not having Bible school and we were planning on doing a, a, a decoration thing today uh, as far as getting things ready for Bible school, but because we're not having Bible school because of, uh, of some situations, uh, we'll be doing something a little later on. Uh, we will be having services here tonight. For all those that you would like to come out for the service tonight, and we'll hear from God's Word. But this morning, I do want to bring the message to you out of Psalms chapter number 8. And again, this is a Psalm of David, as we understand it very clearly. And no doubt, whenever he was with Gath, the tribe of Gath, and and we do know that he was uh, uh, no doubt bringing the, uh, the musical instruments in this way as he was bringing this song. Many of his songs were just not only poems, but they were songs. And, and I can just kind of see David as he was there and as he was kind of letting nightfall fall upon him. And he began to gaze up into the heavens and he began to look at the moon and the stars. Uh, and he began to look at all the things in which God had done and the question comes to mind, what is man? Folks, I want you to understand our title evolves uh, from this wandering psalmist uh, uh, who is trying to find the value of man, not necessarily uh, what man's worth, his net worth, uh, but where man places in God's creation. Now, think about this uh, this morning. When you when you look at this, and he, he, he talks about the heavens, he he talks about the works of the fingers of God. And he talks about the moon and the star. And he sees how great and how big things is. And he wonders uh, where does man fall in the place uh, of God's creation. As big as all these things are and as small as man is, how is it that God would even consider 
to come and visit with man. Uh, oh, friend, friend, I want you to understand uh, that we we think about uh, how big God is and how small that we are. We're nothing, I believe, in the eyes of creation, actually. Uh, I remember so much the, uh, seeing a video of a, of a preacher. He was talking about the universe, and, and as he began to discuss the, how the universe was out there and what all God had made, uh, and he had taken the Hubble station, uh, the, the telescope, and the, as it was taking pictures and of the galaxy that we was around, as you know, we're in the middle of the uh, Milky Way galaxy, and, and he pinpointed Earth, and his fo the further it got away from Earth, the smaller Earth became to the point to where you would just have to know exactly where Earth was at uh, in this big galaxy in which God created, and it just blows your mind when you think about how big everything is and how small earth is and to know that how small man is on earth. Folks, I tell you, we're no bigger than the ant that crawls upon the earth uh, that uh, just with a smush of a thumb, folks, we could be out of here and no longer be thought of. But yet, God was mindful of man. God was mindful of man that he would come and visit him. Man is really smaller than you would even think when it comes to all things, but yet God cared enough, amen, for man to put him here on this earth. Man ranks high, I believe, on the list of, of God's creation uh, because we know that when God began to create according to the book of Genesis in chapter 1 and 2, uh, we know that God put everything in place and then he put man here and when he put man here on the sixth day he said you know I'm going to put man over all the things in which I have now created uh, so God put man high up on the list and what a great blessing that is first Corinthians 11 verse 3 says this right here it says but I would not have you know or I would have you know that the hand of every man is Christ or, or the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. So according to God's word, according to the scriptures this morning, we know that God comes first. Uh, we know that Christ is second in line. And according to our text this morning, uh, that man was made a little lower than the angels, so therefore the angels is third in line, and then there comes man. Now you wonder, where does woman fall into place? Uh, she falls next, and then who falls after that? Uh, the beast of the field. So, so you kind of say that we're at the top of the list, but yet we're not at the bottom of the list. We're kind of stuck in between. Now, folks, I don't know about you, but when I make a sandwich, uh, I, do, I sometimes I enjoy what's on the outside, uh, but I'm going for what's more in the center of that sandwich. That's what makes it good. Uh, so I'm trying to say tonight and this morning that, men we're not all bad. Uh, we're, we're the middle of what's in there and what everybody's going for. So so just know that, you, that you're stuck there for a reason. Amen. Uh, I'm trying to get you to understand uh, that we need to understand what the Scripture's saying, that man uh, was made uh, by the hand of God. Uh, see, God could have just uh, spoke you into existence, but God said, the Bible said, that God took the dust to the ground and he formed man. So he literally, uh, with his hands, uh, put you in a form uh, and, 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 and brought you into, into existence. Uh, and then the Bible said that he breathed uh, the breath of life through the nostrils of man. Uh, just know this morning uh, that before you was even thought of, uh, that God uh, decided to put his breath, uh, his very breath from his very, uh, very lungs uh, into you to make you become a living soul. Uh, and folks, I'm telling you, you get to thinking like, that, that God must have thought enough of you, that he wanted to form you with his hand. He wanted to breathe into your nostrils and make you a living soul. Huh? And then he said, I want to make man in my own image. Huh? And he said, in our image, huh? amen. Huh? As the scripture says, I believe God the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost was right there. And God put a segment of each, every one of them inside of you. Huh? Folks, whenever you, men, when you think about this this morning, when you look in the mirror, just know that you're looking at the image, uh, uh, image of God. Uh, no, I didn't say you were God. Uh, no, I didn't say that you look like God, but you're His 
image. He's given you a mind. He's given you a soul. He's given you a spirit. He's given you a desire to live. And folks, I believe if you search deep enough, he's given you the desire to worship and to praise him and to lift him up. Man was made a little lower than the angels. I said a little lower than the angels. Not a lot lower than the angels, but a little lower than than the angels. Uh, that ought to make you feel good yourself uh, uh, this morning to know that God made you in his image uh, and he made you just a little lower than his angels. In other words, he said, man, I want you to be so close up the line, uh, so close here that whenever time comes uh, that you will be right where I need you to use you as a godly man and a godly father to your family. Uh, man was made <coughs> to have dominion over all things, uh, all the works of God, all things, man. I tell you, men, we ought to be grateful and thankful whenever you look out there. You know, you think about Adam when God put Adam here and he said, I want you to go out and till the ground. I want you to take care of my trees. Uh, I want you to take care of my animals. Uh, I want you to take care of all the things of which I have done. Uh, hey, what a responsibility and what an honor and a privilege God's given us. Uh, then we find out later that God gave man woman and woman gave man child. Uh, and so therefore, man's responsibility was extended. Uh, now he has to take care of all that God's done uh, and, and also God's women, amen, uh, and God's children that he gives them, that we are to nourish them, that we are to feed them, we are to protect them, we are to give to them and do all that we can for them. Uh, what a responsibility. Women, now you know why men act so crazy sometimes and why we act like we're out of our mind. we got a lot of responsibility. We're trying to take care of a lot of things. Uh, whenever we say we're going to the woods, uh, you don't know we're out there taking care of God's stuff. I mean, you better say amen back me up right there. Amen. <laughs> I'm trying to help us out here. But I'm just saying, uh, hey, God's given us a lot, a lot of responsibility to make sure that this is being taken care of. And can I say that whenever with that responsibility comes hard work, uh, that we make sure that all this is done right as best as we can. Listen, the Bible says, uh, bring up in a child and the way they should go, uh, and they'll not depart from it. Uh, listen, we sometimes think uh, that it's the woman's responsibility to teach our children all things. But oh no, it's so much as the man's responsibility to teach them children as well and show them the way uh, toward salvation. If you leave it for your, uh, the mothers uh, only to do the teaching, only to do the guidance, only to do the leading. Uh, man, we're missing the mark somewhere. Our children look up to us as men and as fathers and as grandfathers. Uh, and if we're not living the holy, pure life that we need to before them, then what kind of example are we giving them? Folks, I hate to say it, but how else can they turn to the other side uh, because they're following something that's not real? I'm saying today, make sure that we're taking care of the responsibility. Man was made as a head, as God was a head, and Christ was a head. Man is a head. Amen. Now, I don't know about you. Sometimes my head gets stopped up. Think about that a minute. Sometimes my head gets stopped up, and it needs to get cleared out. That's why God gave man woman. Amen, women. Y'all say amen right there. That's why God gave us some a woman in our life to kind of keep our heads clear because we get cluttered up sometimes. We get stopped up. Uh, we get unfocused sometimes. And we need to get kind of helped in line uh, and get back on track where we need to be. What I'm saying is, even though man's ahead, that does not mean he is the head. God is still the head. Amen. He's head over all. He's even head over the women. Our job, uh, again, as a responsible uh, man, uh, is to be the head that God made us uh, and do it the best we can. And if we fail and if we come short, God forgive us, amen, that we do right the next time around. I'm just trying to help you this morning. I say man is the head. Uh, with that uh, comes that, res that responsibility more and more. Uh, if re uh, hey, listen, uh, I believe it requires commitment uh, on the man's part. Uh, listen, you might say, listen, preacher, I don't like all this responsibility. 
I just want to go somewhere and sit on the creek bank uh, and do a little fishing and just forget about everything. Listen, I'm just here to tell you, uh, you can take this day and you can enjoy this Father's Day. But just know this. Uh, listen, God gives you a responsibility every day of your life. Do the best you can, amen. Don't let him down. Because there's too many people that's looking for the help that they need. What is man? I said, David, the psalmist is sitting here. And I just wonder, because that that uh, that word, uh, that word Gideon up there in the title, if your type book's like, if your Bible's like mine, and it shows it up there, that's in re reference either to a musical instrument or it's in reference to a musical instrument. Tune. So one or the other, uh, David, with him being a musical man, I believe he, he had his instruments. Uh, he was a string instrument man. Uh, yeah, he liked guitars and he liked dulcimers. He liked sorcerers and stuff like that. But uh, So I can kind of see that he's kind of picked up on a new tune. And I kept, kept thinking about that. I thought, wonder what that tune was. It was the sound of man. It was the sound of dad's. It was a sound of fathers. It was a sound of grandfathers. What are you talking about, preacher? I'm talking about, you know what I'm talking about, when daddy would speak out and when daddy would try to correct and when dad would try to do the things he did. And listen, I understand how you, you got men that's got daughters. I can talk to your daughters today and they'll say, yeah, dad, he sounds really tough. He sounds really, uh, really bold and really strong, but he's kind of hard. I had him wrapped around my finger the whole time. They still do. Amen. Hey, what I'm saying, uh, hey, they know the sound of dads. They know the sound of uh, fathers and grandfathers. Uh, but what I'm saying, uh, David got a tune in his head, and he was thinking, what is man to God? That, that God would be mindful of him. You know what it tells me? It tells me that God's got his own mind, man, doesn't he? God thinks about you. God knows what you go through. God knows the, the things in which you are encountering in life. God knows the temptations that comes your way. God knows the pull from the world and the devil <coughs> and, all <that's coughs> and all that is around us. God knows that, and he's got you on his thoughts. You think, well, I want him to be, I want to be in his heart. Listen, he wants to be in your heart, but you need to be in his thoughts. Because if he's thinking about you, then he's going to take care of you. He's going to protect you. Well, I tell you, I don't know the times that I think about how God took care of me and how God watched over me. And, you know, sometimes we men, we just kind of we, we just kind of get lost in our thoughts. You know, we got one-track minds. You know, we think of one thing at a time. That's what they tell us anyway. Uh, but, you know, I, hey, listen, sometimes we get busy working and we don't think about safety. We don't think about things. You know, my, my lovely wife, she always tells me whenever I start using a piece of equipment and, and, and she sees me taking something off, she said, what is that? And I said, well, it's the safety guard. She said, why are you taking it off? Well, I'm a man. We don't need safety guards. You know, we take our chances. We can, we can handle this uh, blade going at so many RPMs in a, in a circle, you know. We know it's not going to cut our fingers off, you know. That's our thought pattern. But, you know, of course, now she uses my equipment, so I have to keep the safety guards on there. But what I'm saying, we men, we sometimes don't think about that kind of stuff. So, boy, ain't it thankful that God's thinking over us and protecting us? Watching over, making sure that we don't cut a finger off or cut a uh, cut our hand off or, or or do something crazy. You know, hey, I've walked off the walk boards before, not even thinking there was an end to it. I'm up there working, I'm doing my stuff. I'm not thinking how close I'm getting, and I'll just step right off the end of it. And then I try to grab that ladder on my way down and and, and, and ride it out, you know. But I'm just saying, hey, God protects us. He's thinking about us. He's mindful. He's mindful of man. Can I? Can I go on and say this? What is man? Man is a soul and a spirit that's formed from the dust of the ground that is crowned with glory and honor. That's what man is. That's what man is. Now, that explains a whole lot, don't it? But I believe sometimes we leave off. After we get to the dust, we leave off the crown of glory and honor. I believe we sometimes need to understand that man deserves the honor and which is bestowed upon him, which should come to him for all that man does. And most of the time, he does for others. First, to bring pre uh, uh, praise to the Creator. 
Man, I'm trying to challenge you now. Make sure that no matter what you do, that you're bringing praise to God. He is the creator. Be sure you thank him. Be sure you're thankful. Be sure you give thanks. Amen. I, what I'm saying is, I believe it ought to be a man's responsibility to lead his family in prayer and in praise and in worship. Amen. I believe it's our responsibility, I said, to do these things. Notice the, chat, the, the start of this chapter and the end of this chapter. In verse number one, the psalmist says, O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in the earth. Look at verse nine. O oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. What's he doing? He started out praising him. He ended out praising him. Even though he's in thought of what is man, God would be mindful of him. What is man? But he gives God praise. I'm saying our first and foremost importance as being a man. Whether we are fathers, grandfathers, or whatever. If we're just young men, listen, young men in the church, our number one priority is to worship God. Give him praise. Listen, fathers, if you don't give God praise and thanks, don't count on your children to give him much praise and thanks. Why? They're going to say, if it's not important to Dad, it's not important to me. Now, my mom and Dad separated when I was just a boy. So I didn't have that fatherly uh, uh, example to follow on. But I had a grandpa that loved God that went to church. And I'd sit beside of my grandpa in church with, with a proud heart. I'm not, I'm not talking about pride. I'm talking about with a proud heart. And I'd sit and watch my grandpa as he'd sit and watch, uh, listen to the preacher. And he'd nod that head. And he'd say, amen, 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 amen. You know what? I learned to say amen, listen to my grandpa. Many a time I watch my grandpa as he'd take up that offer down that hall, all down that hall. Now, my grandpa was a little different. He'd grab that offer plate, and I don't want to mess with God's money here. He'd take that offer plate, he'd go down through there, and he'd hand that offer plate and say, now, give in the name of the Lord. Now, you'd say, what a... Well, he was telling the people, this is what you're supposed to be. Give it. <laughs> give it. <laughs> hey, I learned to give to the Lord by watching my grandpa. You hear? I learned. My grandpa, you heard me talk about it. His job was to ring that bell. But listen, I'm not going to fight over anybody who wants to ring the bell. But I take pride and pride and honor of pulling on that rope back there. Because I've seen my grandpa pull it every service. Let everybody know, hey, it's church time. Hey, my grandpa, he was real, he was gentle. He rang that bell 10 minutes before service, every service. He let everybody in there, everybody know in the neighborhood, hey, you got 10 minutes to get to church. And then whenever it's time to serve, he'd lay down on that bell ring, let everybody know, hey, it's church time. It's time to be here. You better be here. But I tell you, I learned how to ring the bell by listening to my, watching my grandpa. You know, hey, listen, that's not all my grandpa taught me. Many a day, I'd go out in the woods and I'd follow my grandpa. He'd go out there squirrel hunting, and I'd watch. I'd go with him. He'd go fishing. I'd go with him. Hey, he'd go kept collect firewood. I'd go with him. He he learned. Hey, listen. He would uh, put up a tent. I'd learn how to put up a tent. Listen, I followed in his footsteps, and I went where he went. I done what he done. I'm saying all that to say this, man. What kind of example are we putting forth before our children? Are we praying? Are we praising? Are we worshiping? If we want our children to do so, we have to do so. Amen. Amen. Listen, church, I want you to understand secondly. Man gives. I said man gives and does for all others. Secondly, he takes care of God's work. Everything, everything that God's done. Everything that God's put before him, he's got to take care of. And I'm talking about that. I'm talking about that woman God put in your life. I'm talking about those kids God put in your life. He takes care of them. He makes sure they have what they need. Well, you know something? My Heavenly Father takes care of me. He makes sure I have what I need. He makes sure I'm fed. He makes sure I'm, I'm being watched over. He's making sure that everything that I need is right there. Listen, we as men are to take care of the things God's given us. Take care of them. I tell you, sometimes... I, it blows my mind. Sometimes men look at their cars more than they do their wives. Hello. 
Now what, ladies? I'm not trying to help you out here. Sometimes a man, he'll look at that gun and think more of it than he does his children. Sometimes he'll look at he'll look at this earthly stuff that he has and he says, man, that's mine and I'm going to take care of it. Gonna, listen, if you take care of your family like you do some of the stuff you enjoy, i tell you what, you have a good family. Amen. I know that's a little hard medicine to take, but I, I tried to ease it over a while ago by saying some other stuff. I'm just saying Take care of what God gives you. I believe it's important. God put it before you. God gave it to you. Take care of it. So man does deserve his praise and his honor. For God made him for all that. You know, God gave, God made man to where he'll go out there and work and sweat and, and, and put his life in danger to make sure everybody has what they have. To make sure that everybody has food on the table, clothes on their back, a roof over their head. He'll do all that he can. You say, well, my husband, he can't, he can't do a lot of that stuff. He can't build this or he can't build that. Listen, God takes care of all that when I'm trying to say be thankful for what he does. He has an act for doing it. Be thankful. Be thankful. Very, very important part of this text is just within the question which they asked. I said, he said, what is man? that thou art mindful of him. God did not create man to put him here on this earth and then leave him and to forget about him. He did not put man down here and say, listen, you just go on your own and do the best you can. Figure it out for yourself, because we're going to do it anyway. Amen. You know what I'm talking about. You go get something, you get them instructions. Halfway through the build, you say, you reckon I'll look the instructions, figure out what I'm doing wrong. Hey, we get, we've got, we're going to figure it out. God says, listen, you just go ahead and you're going to figure it out anyway. It might not come out right, but you're going to figure it out. As long as it works, who cares? Huh? I mean, who cares if we got all them extra parts? Hey, we didn't guarantee it lasts forever just as long as it lasts for a day or two. <laughs> it's job security. We know we'd get, come back and work on it again. Hey, I'm saying, God said, listen, God didn't put men here to do that. God said, I'm going to be right by your side. I'm going to help you. I'm going to, God created man so that he can have a relationship with him. Man, think about that. God wants a relationship with you. A personal relationship. You know, in the if you look back over there in the book of Genesis, and whenever Adam was in, would, walk, would walk through the garden at, at the cool to eat, who, God was with him, did the same thing about Eve. God come to have a relationship with man. Man's having a relationship with woman. And then man teaches woman how to have a relationship with God. There's another responsibility. Well, I tell you, I don't know about you, but I'm getting overwhelmed this morning with all these responsibilities. You say, well, how long can we do this? By the help of God. You won't do it without him. I said, I said, listen now. He, he, he said, he said, God created man to have a relationship with him so God could walk and talk with him so that God could commune with him. Revelations 3 and verse 20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He said, If any man, if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come unto him and will sup with him and he with me. So God says, Listen, I, I just did not create you. So you can be another thing, breathing on this ground and walking around and with a caring life. Listen, I created you so I can have a relationship with you. I want to come and sit down with you. I want to sit a spell. That word commune talk about. He, he, hey, listen, he wants to say, he wants to be around for a while. He, he don't want to just come in and say, hey, how you doing, Lee? He wants to sit a while. He wants to, I think about old Abraham. The Bible said that he was over there in the shade tree, and there was God sitting with him. Now, I don't know. I don't understand the whole situation. I don't know what Abraham saw. I don't know why Abraham didn't describe what he saw there. But he was talking with God under the shade tree that day. And they had a communication. And it was all about someone lost in a war in a city that needed to be saved. Huh? So we kind of see another responsibility that's coming man's way. Man ought to be concerned for the, for the, for the soul and the salvation of of other people. See, God wants to have a relationship it's to the point to where you can take and share that relationship with someone else. 
so that someone else can keep from going to hell. I am so grateful and thankful. But I remember the day that my son came to me. And he came to me and said, Daddy, I want to be saved. I said, well, son, I said, you will be one of these days. You just keep praying. Maybe God will show you the way. I said, now you need to go on. Get ready for bed. A little while later, he went in there and put his jones on. He came back out. He stopped there, and I was sitting on the couch. He said, Daddy, I, I, I want to be saved. I said, son, I said, I understand you want to be saved. And I said, it's going to happen. But I said, right now, you need to get your teeth brushed, and you need to get to bed. He said, preacher, why didn't you just tell him? Because I didn't want to make sure that it was me that wanted him to get saved as much as he did. He went in there and brushed his teeth and he come back out with tears running down his eyes. He said, Daddy, I need to get saved now. I said, son, if you'll sit down right here, I want to show you something. I took the word of God and opened it up and showed him the scripture. I told him what the Bible said about being saved, how to get saved. I said, son, is that what you want to do? I said, do you really want to go through this right now at this time of your life and ask Jesus into your heart? And he said, Daddy, I've got to do it. i got to do it. I said, why? Why do you have to do it right now, son? He said, Daddy, he said, if I don't, I'm going to hell. He said, I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to hell. And that night, beside the couch, my son and I got on their knees. He called out and asked Jesus into his heart to be his personal savior. Glory to God, amen. Listen, I'm telling you, that time will come. It'll come. You know why? Because there was a daddy that loved God, that cared enough to make sure that his child was in church. His child knew his daddy could pray. His daddy read the Bible. His daddy knew. Listen, folks, all this, all this is taking place before I ever started pastoring. I was just a layman in church. Took that Bible and showed him how to get saved. I'm saying, be the daddy that God wants you to be. Open the door when he knocks. I, I believe God loves his creation. God loves man. What is man? What is man that thou will visit with him? That's what the psalm is saying. That word visit is plural. It's plural. It said visits. It didn't say visit one time. It didn't use an ED at the end of it. It's plural for a purpose and a reason. Why? Because God wants to come more than just one time. God wants to come just more than one time a week on Sunday morning at 11 o'clock. Hello. He wants to come every opportunity that he knocks on the heart door and say, can I come in and stuff with you for a while? I want to come in and talk to you. I want to come in and fellowship with you. I want to sit a spell. I want to spend some time with you. Folks, I tell you, God comes and knock and I want him around. I want him around. I don't care what time of the day, what time of the night. I don't care when it is. Listen, folks, the other night when I was praying about what to preach this morning, it's about 3 o'clock in the morning. I was I was in and out of sleep, and this happens a lot in my life. You say, are you worried about something? No, I'm just normal at this age of my life where you get up, get up more and you stay in the bed. And I was got to thinking, Lord, <coughs> what do I preach? What can I tell him then? He said, well, what is man? That I was mindful of him, that I wanted to visit with him. Oh, I was thankful God visited me that morning. Why? So that I could bring this message to you this morning. What I'm saying is, God wants to. God wants to visit with us. God wants to come and stay with us. I'm talking about salvation. It only happens with salvation. See, so God will come to a lost man's heart. He'll knock on that heart. He'll come and he'll say, let me in. But if we don't let him in, he'll come back around later and he'll say, I'm here again. I sure would like to come in. If you don't let him in that time, He'll come, he'll come a time or two more. But eventually, if you don't open that door, he'll say, well, you know what? Apparently, he don't want me. He don't want me to come in. The Bible said he chose you before you chose him. He loved you before you loved him. Huh? What I'm saying is, God come and knock on your door. You didn't knock on his. Why don't you let him in? Because there's going to be a day that he's going to say, well, you know what? Apparently, he don't want me. So I'm just going to back off. I'm going to leave him alone. 
I'm just going to let him live his life. Let him do what he wants to. If he chooses to go to hell, it's his business, not mine. What I'm saying this morning, God wants to visit me for eternity. How does all this become possible? Man must become what God intends for him to become, which is holy, which is responsible, which is to take the leadership. I believe that man should be the spiritual leader in the home. I believe the man ought to be the leader in the church. I believe that man is to oversee his family and the church. And I believe that man is not to be a stumbling block according to Psalms 1 1. Don't sit in the seat of the ungodly in the seat of the council. Sit in church. Sit in church. Never, man never, never be, should never be the reason why his children do not know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. Man should never be the reason why your family does not want to go to church. Well, daddy don't go, why should I? Daddy don't care, why should I? It's nothing to him, why should it be to me? Men should never give this world the satisfaction of saying, Church in Christ is not real. You know, I'm afraid that's what a lot of men do is they paint that picture. Out in our communities and in our neighborhood. Listen, folks, this world knows what you do. I walked into I walked into West Court, grocery store down below my house. Yesterday went in there to get me some sausage. Looked at a young man behind the counter back there. I said, Where's all the sausage? And he said, Well, you're too late today, sir. And he said, we don't have any. It'll be Thursday before we get our next batch made. And then he looked at me and he said, so do you live up the mountain? <laughs> I don't know this kid from that. I said, well, I said, part-time, <laughs> sort of speak. I said, we're up there and down here. He said, well, I see you up all the time. I'm looking at him like, who in the world are you? <laughs> I come home and told my wife. She said, well, now that's kind of scary. I said, that ain't the hype of it. I said, that just lets me know that everybody's knowing me. I said, I can't do anything. She said, yeah, you can't holler at me and beat on me no more out in public. Everybody knows it. <laughs> so I don't beat her, folks. I promise you I do not. But what I'm saying is, that young boy seen me. Hey, listen, I walked in the store down here on 19th and I walked out. There was a young lady come out, got out of her truck and was going and shook me. She said, how's it going, preacher? And I looked and said, fine. Who in the world are you? You say, why am I saying that? I'm saying that because I want the people to know that I'm real and the God I serve is real. I don't want to give them a reason not to know. And this world knows you and they know who you are and they watch you. And when they see you not going to church, not serving God, not praying, not reading, not worshiping, they get to thinking it's not real. Don't come. Don't come. Their satisfaction. In conclusion, and I'm going to finish up this morning. The more godly men are, and the more godly men that we have, the more godly churches we'll have. And I believe that. I, I see a lot of women over the years that get excited and shout and praise the Lord and worship God. I think that's wonderful. But where's the men? The more godly men that we have, the more godly churches we have, the more godly homes we're going to have. We're going to sit in a home and the more godly children we will produce. So men, what I'm saying is our responsibility is huge and I believe God expects it of us. The question is are we where we need to be? Let's have our head bowed and eye closed this morning. Sister, if you would come to the communion.